just when I thought I was out, I pull myself right back in. Yep, we're doing another one of these videos, the top games of the year list. That's become a tradition on my channel, apparently. I really didn't think I'd be making another one of these videos this year, because I really didn't play anything worth talking about for the majority of it. But then fall rolled around and everything was coming out like boom, 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 boom. Anyhow, you all just know the gist of how these lists work. My list generally consists of very weird and non-AAA picks for Game of the Year. Not on purpose, but because I'm so broke that I couldn't even list some if I wanted to. At least on a moral level. So, sorry, but you're not going to be hearing picks such as Horizon Zero Dawn, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, or Super Mario Odyssey. Although, I did play a bit of those games, and I must say, they're quite good. If I played more of them, or even more of a lazy, moralist fuck than I already am, they would definitely be on this list. Just getting that out of the way in case you clicked on this video expecting that, which, judging by the fairly clickbait thumbnail, I honestly can't blame you. Also, another thing worth noting is that some of the footage in this video was not recorded by me, but by other YouTubers. Disclaimers will be on screen, and links to their channels will be in the description below, and maybe on screen, if I can get that to work. Alright, enough jibber jabber. Here are my top five games of 2017. Number V. Or, well, I guess five. <sighs> Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria Simulator. Another year, another FNAF, apparently. Yep, Scott decided to release a new one out of nowhere on the very last month of the year. And since it didn't cost me any shekels, you know my cheap ass how to check it out. So far, this has been my second foray into the series, and my official introduction to the more traditional formulas the series is known for. If you'll recall from the previous Top 5 video I made last year, I mentioned how I wasn't all that impressed with FNAF World, and still wasn't a fan of the series outside of maybe the lore. Of course, FNAF World was a spin-off, and I couldn't truly gauge whether or not I would like the other games in the series, but after playing a game featuring distinct gameplay style, I can definitely say that I'm still not a fan. For what it's worth, I don't think the game is inherently terrible. Heck, I still might even say it's better overall than FNAF World. It's just the core gameplay is not my cup of tea, which is kind of what I expected looking at the series on the outside. Pizzeria Simulator is split up into three parts. You have the restaurant management segment, where you purchase items and place them in your restaurant, the office phases, which play like your typical FNAF affair, and the salvage sections, which involve you trying to survive through five audio tapes while not getting jump scared by an animatronic. There's also a few mini games you can play by purchasing various objects and placing them in your restaurant, but they're a lesser part of the gameplay. And while I found two thirds of the game to be just fine, I didn't really like the part that actually made it a legit FNAF game. I know, crazy, right? How can you like a FNAF game, but not like the FNAF gameplay? I guess it's because the core gameplay formula of a Five Nights at Freddy's game is too tedious and infuriating at times. Especially Pizzeria Simulator, as this one requires you to be more patient than previous games, where you were clicking and switching between stuff non-stop. I guess fans would say the tedium is a part of the challenge of FNAF, as you need to map out a strategy and master switching between the mechanics to survive, but I don't know if the challenge is really rewarding at all. It just seems too pointless and time-consuming playing these sections over and over again for what generally amounts in a trivial windscreen. I just don't like a bunch of trial and error in video games, especially when I feel it's a waste of my time and bullshit. It also doesn't help that the FNAF series is known for being a bit RNG and luck-based, which I think adds to the bullshit for me. I mean, I'm okay dying constantly in Splatterhouse 2 until I win because it feels satisfying when I master the controls and level patterns and conquer a section of the game, but FNAF I just don't see the point. I don't know, maybe I'm just being too cynical or a baby. This is apparently the easiest FNAF game, so perhaps I should just shut up and play it till I get it right. I am on night 5 as well, so I'm almost done with the game, but I don't know, it might be as far as I'm making it. According to Steam, I've already put in about 6 hours into this game and I think that's enough time as it is. I don't want to potentially invest 15 to 20 hours into this game, but don't let my words sway you. If you want to make an opinion for yourself, you can download it for free and try it out. Maybe you'll have more fun with it than me. Number IV Or, as the Romans say, 4. South Park Phone Destroyer! Thank you, Trey Parker. Yes, we do have a South Park game on this list, but it's not the Fractured Butthole. It's the mobile game. Phone Destroyer! Um, thanks again, Trey. 
While it's nowhere near comparable to the fractured butthole in quality, heck, it's not even comparable to Stick of Truth, it's still a quality South Park game nonetheless. Just on a different scale. A mobile scale. Not that that's a bad thing, it just means what's quality for this game wouldn't be quality for a console game, because they're on vastly different platforms. Anyhow... Trey, stop. We get it already. <sighs> Phone Destroyer is a mixture of genres. It's one part card game, one part tower defense, and one part real-time strategy. These genres mix pretty well and make for a fun, chaotic, and slightly strategic mobile game. The way you play Phone Destroyer is by making a deck of cards and by dropping each one onto the battlefield. A unit will spawn and then fight for you. The basic goal of a battle differs slightly depending on what mode you play. In the multiplayer mode, whoever does the most damage to their opponent within the time limit wins. In the story mode, you need to defeat the main enemy of the level before they defeat you. The single player and multiplayer portions of this game are both solid and equally enjoyable. The story even features a few cutscenes in a similar fashion to the ones seen in the Stick of Truth and the Fractured Butthole. The only problem I have with this game is that in order to progress in certain points of the story, you have to win a number of online matches. Not because you need to level up and improve your deck due to enemies getting progressively harder, but because there is a literal wall that says you need to win some matches just because. This was a really dumb design choice, and I imagine this would make completing the story next to impossible if players lose interest in the future. I get you wanted me to check out the multiplayer side of the game and not focus solely on the single player, but the special timed events you run should be incentive enough for me to check it out. You shouldn't need to force me to play it by adding in an arbitrary win wall. Despite that annoying aspect, the game is still pretty fun and makes for a good game on the go. If you like card-based strategy games or just South Park in general, I think you'll get a kick out of this game. Number three. Uh, three. That's that's totally what I said. Animal Crossing Pocket Camp. I had never played an Animal Crossing game before, and honestly wasn't super interested in the series. But I still wanted to give it a try before I completely dismissed it, which is why I downloaded this game. So this game served as sort of an introduction to the series for me. And I gotta say, from what I've played so far, it's not bad. It's a pretty casual experience, but I still find it fairly enjoyable. Essentially, you go around fulfilling every animal's request, and in doing so, raise their friendship level. By raising their friendship level, you receive several rewards. The rewards you receive from doing these various tasks are used to build items to customize your camp, or the inside of your camper. And depending on what items you craft and place in your camp, you'll attract more animals to your campsite. This allows you to further raise your friendship level and invite more animals to your camp, and the cycle continues from there. This is essentially an authentic Animal Crossing experience on mobile, and not a generic town building game with Animal Crossing characters, which is what I was afraid this game might have turned into. Thankfully, Nintendo didn't go the Fire Emblem Heroes route, and made a game that is both quality, fun, and unique for mobile devices. After playing this game, I can definitely say I am interested in playing more of the series, especially a more console-oriented Animal Crossing game. That way I can continue doing tasks for people and spend less time waiting, which is a bit of a downer with this game. So, whether or not you're into Animal Crossing, download this game and give it a try. Who knows, you might actually enjoy it. Number douche. Deuce? Dose? Ah, screw it. Number two. Stranger Things The Game. Believe it or not, the second best game I played this year is a licensed mobile game based off of Stranger Things. I always like to keep my list interesting, don't I? Well, the reason it's at number two is because not only would I say this game is good, but it's a lot better than it needs to be. This was basically pitched as a clever way of advertising the upcoming Season 2 of Stranger Things, which I watched, by the way, and I can confirm it was good, an 8-bit inspired game based around the show that could be downloaded on your phone. It didn't have to be structured like an actual game with a beginning, middle, and end. It didn't have to be completely free for anyone to download and play without worrying about ads and microtransactions. It could have made it an endless experience with constant content updates and filled to the brim with advertisements and in-game purchases like every other free-to-play mobile game. But they didn't. They essentially made a quality mobile game they could have charged money for, but instead allowed it to be free for everyone. And honestly, I think Netflix should be commended on that fact alone. They could have gotten like five bucks out of me, no problem, but out of the goodness of their hearts, decided not to. Good on you, Netflix. 
but besides the game being totally free, more importantly, the game is a good experience overall. You start out as Jim Hopper, a small town sheriff of Hawkins, Indiana, and can eventually build an entire party of characters from the show. The gameplay consists of traversing the open world of Hawkins and going to specific locations in town. Once you reach said locations, you enter a maze-like dungeon and must solve puzzles by switching between the characters in your party. This all leads up to a boss fight, and once you beat that boss, you clear that chapter of the game. There's also a story to this game, but it's not based off the plot of Season 2, so no need to worry about spoilers there. However, I do recommend you at least watch Season 1 of this show before jumping into this game, as the plot is loosely based off of that one. Also, you'll be more familiar with the universe. My only complaint with this game would be the movement controls. To move characters around and interact with objects, you have to tap on various parts of the screen. Tapping on objects like this is fine, but it is a bit annoying to have your finger in the way of the screen all the time when you're trying to go somewhere. I think a more traditional D-pad similar to the one found in Pocket Morty's would have been a better choice. Other than that, the game controlled fine, and I would definitely recommend all fans of Stranger Things or retro games in general to download this game now. Before we get to my game of the year, and to pad the video out further, here are some of the games I got to play in 2017 that didn't quite make my list. Call of Duty World War II Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy Injustice 2 WWE 2K18 and NBA 2K18, because why not? Fire Emblem Heroes, even though I didn't really like that game. And of course, the three games I mentioned earlier, Horizon Zero Dawn, Super Mario Odyssey, and The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. So, yeah, that's all the highlights. Now, on to my game of the year, which is... Mass Effect Andromeda. No, I'm obviously joking. It's... Life of Black Tiger! Okay, seriously, I gotta stop with these fake-outs for my number one spot. This joke is starting to get old, and I'm running out of ideas to make it different each time. Let's just get to my game of the year and end this video already, shall we? Numero uno! Go fish! Oh, wait, that's the wrong game. And it's number one, so... the. Well, Cuphead and his pal Bug Man. Cuphead. There were a lot of great games released this year, and while I did get my hands on quite a bit of them in one form or another, Cuphead is the one I spent the most time with, and therefore can make a definitive decision on. It's a great game on its own, despite this discrepancy, and without a doubt deserves its nomination. In terms of aesthetics, this game is totally unique and a breath of fresh air in this current gaming climate. The controls are spot on, the gameplay is fun yet challenging, and each boss you face is more interesting than the last. It's also a great couch co-op game, and had me going over to my friend's house specifically just to play it with him. While it was a tough endeavor, we eventually beat the game and had a fun time doing it. I will definitely cherish the memories and frustrations we had playing this game together for many years to come. Honestly, what more can I really say that hasn't been said about this game already? It's an amazing indie title, and a true homage to vintage 1930s animated cartoons and classic run-and-gun games of the retro gaming era. The only two possible complaints I could have with this game are there weren't enough run-and-gun style levels, and some of the bosses had some pretty random or hard-to-avoid attacks. I'm looking at you, Calamari and Dr. Call. Besides those minor complaints, this game is still fantastic. If you have some patience and can appreciate a good challenge, play Cuphead immediately. It's definitely one of the best games to come out this year, and for better or worse, I'll be looking forward to a sequel at some point in the future. And those are my top 5 games of 2017. I hope you all enjoyed this video and agree with my list. Let me know your picks for Game of the Year in the comments down below. And I suppose I'll be seeing you all again next year for another countdown, but until then, happy 2018 everyone. Cheers.